Everybody Hates Rand is a Wheel of Time podcast that will contain spoilers for all 14 books. So if you're anti-spoiler, stop this, read all 14 books, and come back. We'll be here, waiting. Our title is a joke and is meant to be taken as such. Everybody in this context refers to us and our cats. You are free to feel however you want about Rand. He's a fictional character. Please don't DM us. The world is a mess, dark one stretching out his hand. The dragon's reborn, the fire's been fanned, but everybody hates Rand. Everybody hates Rand. Everybody hates Rand. Okay. Hi. Hi. <laughs> How are we doing, folks? Well, I never thought I'd say it, you guys, but I miss Robert Jordan. Isn't it shocking how <laughs> quickly a map point of view can make you be like, God, I miss that dead fucker. I miss him. Please, Robert. Rise. God, please give me one more miracle. Please. And bring him back from the dead Just in let order him. to finish these map points of view. They're so bad, you guys. I was like... And it's so frustrating because it's not like Brandon Sanderson is a bad writer, necessarily. No, he has a lot of really renowned strength <laughs> yeah. as a writer so i'm like this is just like your fatal flaw or something my yeah, dude like you just can't, can't get it right you can't make it i think it's just that um brandon sanderson deals with character archetypes and i don't mean that necessarily in like a mythological sense but mm. in a brandon sanderson's own personal arsenal of character archetypes sure and one of those is like comic relief yeah slash trickstery guy yeah so it's like he brings out his archetype for that and is like don't i can't bring the robert jordan nuance to that i just have to make him a stupid goofball yeah that's not even in a fun way yeah i think that makes a lot of sense i and yeah i think we've hit on this a lot but i think it comes from again it's like a fundamental misunderstanding of matt as a character like he's not comic relief even though he is funny like that is not the role he is filling so to put so much attention on that yeah and even when matt is funny he's also deeply upsetting at times like yeah it betrays a real a lot of what robert jordan thought was funny wasn't actually funny yeah and i think what makes matt stand out as a funny character is that a lot of what he thought was funny in regards to Matt was actually funny. Right. Like, he did successfully write comedy when it came to Matt, as opposed to Nynaeve or Elaine or Edwin when the comedy just turned out to be misogyny. Yes. Um, Which is not to say that some of Matt's comedy doesn't also involve misogyny, but a lot of it is also just straight up funny, just him being kind of a weird little dude. Yeah. Um, And yeah, I don't think that was possible for good old brando sando to um get his hands on the good news such that it is is that the next and penultimate section we'll be covering in towers of midnight involves the tower of genji and i do believe the bulk of that is a sort of more familiar version of matt i think robert jordan probably before he passed away that was one of the things he wanted to like good right or at least draft that scene so um, I hope I don't eat those words. I think I have in the past thought been completely proven wrong when I came back to it. But my recollection is that Matt's a little less. A little less. A little less. <laughs> He's just TM. a little less. Just a little a little better. There are still some Brando Sando-isms to deal with, but generally it's better. But we still got to get through his single point of view here and of course we also have the other most insufferable character elaine although that at least has been a through line in the yeah elaine doesn't <laughs> read any changing of the guard to me <laughs> yeah. she's just as annoying she's just like whatever let's introduce ourselves yeah this is everybody <laughs> hates rand your friendly neighborhood wheel of time podcast i'm emily jushaw and i am sally gidger and this is ed and tibbles there um we can see them mostly we can see ed's foot yeah. Which he is just sort of hiding behind. Sticking out. Ed likes to put his feet in the weirdest 
configurations. Yeah. That's the cat update for you to uh, know that we have soothing a soothing visual image as we are. Yeah. Talking about this fucking bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We have Elaine. Um, we start with a chapter in which Elaine enacts a plan to consolidate rule in Kyrian. Her big plan is to strip the Andoran noblewomen, the three ladies who rebelled against her, of their lands and titles, and then award those lands and titles to some of the Kyrianan nobility, and vice versa, give some Kyrianan land, primarily her own land. She's luckily not taking it from anyone. Um, to the disgraced Andoran nobility, which is kind of funny because it's like, so there's no real punishment for these people. You, no. They just still get to be noble people. You're just like banishing them to Kyrian or whatever. Yeah, Elaine's like, when she initially is like, I'm stripping you of your lands and titles, she's like, this is basically a death sentence because they'll just commit suicide rather than face the shame. And I'm like, that sounds like a them problem not to be extremely rude but stripping someone of their lands and titles is an extremely reasonable yeah punishment for rebellion yeah against the crown like that's a totally normal thing to do yeah um and so if they are going to kill themselves over it then like yeah that's has to do more with your class system generally than with you as a person yeah, we talked about this at length when the same thing happened with Colavir. Colavir, which Elaine cites. Yeah, she's like, that was so sad. And it's just like... It's not that sad when... <laughs> it it really isn't. Like, I don't want to be like, I've exhausted my empathy for rich people. But, like, I have. Like, when this series is trying to tell me, like, people are literally starving to death. And Elaine's like, these people will feel so disgraced because I've taken away all their land and money and now they have to get jobs like real people i'm like okay yeah i don't have a lot to give to those people yeah or to this plot in general like all like you're just i'm sick of it yeah also the way the narrative functioned not that i necessarily agree w with it but robert jordan in the few points of view we got from these women was to make them out to be the most insufferable yeah most stupid most evil women on the planet so I'm already not coming from a great position in the empathy game. Mm -hmm. You know, whatever empathy I've scratched up has been in spite of Robert Jordan. Yeah. So it's like the narrative is like, oh, don't you feel bad for them? And I'm like, no. And no. you don't want me to. So why are we doing this charade? Yeah, I don't feel bad for them. And like Emily said, these women had will have a choice to make something out of their situation. Whatever. Um, this whole move... <sighs> is very performative. Elaine, like, does it for an audience. And then everyone acts like it is, like, fucking Bobby Fischer in here. 5D chess. Yeah, sorry if that was an aged <laughs> reference. Sorry if that revealed <laughs> how old I am. But, um, yeah, we're supposed to act like it's the most brilliant political maneuver of all time. Like a lot of Elaine's political maneuvers, when, to me, it just seems like, yeah, okay. Yeah, I Pretty feel Pretty mediocre. Like, I feel like I in particular get on my soapbox about this all the time because I am very, like, I don't personally find a lot of fulfillment from political fantasy where, like, we're seeing a lot of the action of the book takes place in these types of political mover, man, movers, political maneuvers. maneuvers. Um, it just doesn't feel particularly satisfying to me unless it's done incredibly well or in like with an interesting angle. We often reference the Goblin Emperor by Catherine Addison as like a fantasy with a political court focus that is doing interesting things. And I was thinking about it a lot last night because I was so just mad at this entire section. Like Matt's point of view is bad. And this is Elaine just, again annexing an entirely other country and being like that is really girl boss and powerful of me <laughs> and the way she does it exactly like emily said is 
for everyone being like that was the most genius and risky political maneuver like that could have gone so bad for you but it worked out so well because you're so brilliant and then in the next chapter when she takes the throne she's like nobody ex like what happens is the people she gives andor and land to escort her to the kyrian and throne with their little armies and she's like nobody expected this slay nobody expected i would come in with a kyrian and army and it's like okay like it just i'm losing my thread and my annoyance but um Elaine, especially in this book, has just been successful every single time she does something. And I know we're speed running to the last battle, but it makes her such an insufferable character because, like, she never fails. Oh, ever. Except when she fails hard, as in getting half her dark friend prisoners killed and herself stabbed. Yeah. Yeah. Like, but, like politically. But, like, politically, she never fails and, like, doesn't really fail. I know we talk a lot about the, like, structure like what the narrative is upholding like the narrative doesn't say it's a bad thing that elaine went and did yeah. this it's not like everyone being like that was fucking stupid and now there's a bunch of consequences opposed on elaine everyone was just like that was fucking stupid and the narrative is like how dare you call elaine yeah stupid she's actually yeah, perfect zero consequences yeah like there's nobody who's mad at her nobody who loses faith in her ability to lead except for brigitte who is constantly gaslit um so it's just like exhausting to read about her as a character because she's so perfect like everything she does all the time is perfect yeah and this is a really sh tell don't show yeah thing as well the reason that we're led to believe everything elaine does is perfect and good and works out great is a because no consequences mm -hmm. but b because all of the characters around her yeah who are also politicians are lauding her achievements yeah. or style and etc etc um and we know that it's supposed to be extremely complicated and only smart people would understand it because Brigitte, a jock, has to have yeah. it explained to her, which is a real bummer because Brigitte is a smart woman, yeah. as we've seen in the past. Yeah. <laughs> Brigitte, a jock. Which is just an excuse for the authors to condescendingly explain it to us as though we didn't get it. Yeah. We did get it. I got and it. And it was fine. And it's dumb and it doesn't matter. Like, I don't under, I don't have any skin in the teeth on who sits on the fucking throne of Kyrian. Yeah, and it's just at this point we're desperate to have someone on the throne of Kyrian because every little country in this continent has to be wrapped up in a neat package. Yeah. With someone at the helm when we go to the last battle. And so that's going to be Elaine. And now we're getting into timeline shenanigans. As we find out, the meeting preceding the last battle is literally tomorrow. Literally tomorrow. So Elaine will have held the throne of Kyrian for less than 24 hours. Before the last battle kicks off, basically. She has not spent any time in Kyrian except for a little riverbank escapade way back in book three when she, Nynaeve, and yeah. Edwin were wandering through the Civil War-torn countryside. Being like, look at these peasants. Yeah. I don't know if that's actually what they were doing, but that seems to be what Elaine is always doing. And um, this is, you know, indicative of the way politics actually operated in the 17 and 1800s in Europe. People could inherit thrones and things without ever sure. actually setting foot in them. And that's fine. That's not my business, I guess. But it's a little irritating to have Elaine be so high and mighty about it. Like, of course, no one else deserves the throne of Kyrian. It's just very, like, divine right of kings. Yeah. Which doesn't necessarily mesh with the actual, like, um, era that this yeah. book is prompting us to think of, usually. Yeah, um, equating it to, like, history, the way we're, you know, thinking 17-ish hundreds, vaguely, I don't know, somewhere in there, not necessarily, like, the 13, 1400s. Um, but also, like, we're very much in a society in a world that is on the brink of like critical changes like rand um is a shepherd boy mm -hmm. who's become king of the world basically you know and all these other things that are happening to change um political systems and cultures and the way that people think about things and technology and like none of that really jives with Elaine getting the throne of Kyrian and of Kyrian because her daddy was Kyrian and, and because her boyfriend said so. Yeah, actual timeline, you know, parallels. We are on the brink of the French Revolution. Yeah. 
but I don't ever believe that the French Revolution is going to happen because this text is so monarchist mm -hmm. um, and would die before guillotining Elaine. Could you imagine? <laughs> if that's just how her If that's just subplot. She it. walks into Kyrian and the two noblemen who are her like little pet Frenchies are like, actually Fuck leading you. you to a guillotine yeah. and then they just kill Elaine. And everyone's like, whoa. <laughs> Two days before oh the last battle. Everything's messed up again and yeah. Rand just has to go do the last battle After with his... <laughs> The, his pregnant girlfriend. Yeah, I don't want Elaine's children to be harmed. Obviously, they didn't do anything except be conceived, but it would be iconic if the French just guillotined Elaine. Yeah, it would be. Wouldn't it? But that would be a risky maneuver. <laughs> yeah. And would risk upsetting the sort of like fantasy coded balance of monarchy is always the most homely and the most nostalgic system of government that we must worship and embody as though Aragorn, son of Arathorn, is sitting on literally every throne. Right. And like, so much I think of the project of showing us Elaine do good things all the time is in order to uphold this idea that Elaine is a good queen and therefore monarchy is good because good people sit on thrones. And that's just like, historically untrue. Mm hmm. Uh, historically, the people who sit on thrones are about as competent as your average person, which means largely incompetent. Largely in, yeah, it's just like, also like politics have always rotted people's brains. Like, look at what your elected official is doing. And mm -hmm. that was what the Queen of England was doing. And at any given point, you know? Yeah, when you surround people with yes men, which is what Brigitte had, I mean, Elaine has in yeah. Morgoth, Dielin, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Pretty much everyone but Brigitte. Yeah. Of course it's going to rot your brain. So that is my beef with Elaine being the most perfect woman who's ever done anything. Yeah, Um. we find out that Dobrain is just not around. Just missing. Yeah, like Elaine is able to sweep in here and take the throne of Kyrie and absent the steward that Rand left because Dobrain is ugh. gone. I think he's maybe in Arid Doman or something. Yeah, I think that's where Rand sent but him But it is last. unclear where Dobrain... He also very recently was recovering from an intense stabbing, so... Hashtag where is Dobrain? Hashtag where is Dobrain? Is this a sort of, like, King of Ilion? He's yeah. actually squirreled away somewhere <laughs> he's and in the White dead. Tower. He's yeah. being held captive. Give me, show me Dobrain. Dobrain is the only one I trust to lead any country at this know. point. God, I love that man. Um, Elaine's pet Frenchman, like you referenced. <laughs> one of them is a noble person whose name we've heard thrown around before. Another one is a totally new guy who has never been introduced and now is mega important. Yeah. Um, I don't actually recall how relevant Kyrian and politics will be, but I assume these names will come up yeah. in the next book as we get into sort of the politics of the last battle and whether people are going to agree with Rand or Edwin about whether the seals will be broken. Gosh, I wonder what happens. Mm -hmm. um, I was also thinking about like the, when you're thinking about crafting a story, like how much you cater to realism versus how much you cater to the fact that this is a narrative and narrative mm -hmm. functions just different than real life. So, like, is it realistic that Elaine would have to deal with new people and new important political players as she makes new alliances going to the last battle? Yes, of course. For sure, for sure. Is that, like, functional in a narrative where I already have a lot of important people to keep track of? No. Like, if you really needed an important Kyrie and on the table, Dobrain could have just done there. this for yeah. us. So it was really frustrating me that we keep getting introduced to new people and new plots and like, yes, that is realistic in a story that's really committed to being like multinational, international, geopolitical conflict. But it's like, we are heading towards our archetypal, archetypal apocalypse. Can we please start to wrap things, dial up. it back in? Yeah, I don't want to have to keep track of these guys. The narrative, I think we've talked about this before in a series as long as this one should be shaped like a diamond. Yes. We start with a limited cast, we expand out into a much larger cast, and then the cast winnows down to the important people mm -hmm. and or, you know, the alive people. <laughs> yeah. R.I.P. Asmodan. 
we salute you. Yeah, I know. But, like, that's the shape it should be taking. And largely the narrative, for one reason or another, has been wildly resisting this. So yeah. instead we're left with a really, like, bottom-heavy yeah. narrative. It's more like a pyramid. Yeah, like... And that's not sustainable because what will happen is the book's gonna end and we're still gonna have this wide base of mm-hmm. unfulfilled subplots. Mm-hmm. Which just makes it confusing, I think, as a reader... Yeah, and, and unfulfilling. Maybe that was on some level intentional on Robert Jordan's part. I imagine he expected to keep writing books within this universe. Yeah. That took place after the last battle or whatever, but things didn't work out that way. And Brandon Sanderson, if you asked for three books as opposed to one, what were you going to do with those three books except to narrow things down? Yeah. And instead you kept going with the original plan yeah except you instead you added an andrel who i just have to now know with, intimately with. <laughs> uh we're gonna skip rand's or uh, min's excuse me point of view for a minute and just finish up elaine yeah. uh arriving in kyrian like sally mentioned she gets escorted into the city by the armies of these men to whom she has awarded andrew and lands to um enters the palace there's a big thing where Brigitte has to check the throne for tools of assassination and does find like a needle that I guess would have poked Elaine in the ass and killed her which (laughs) honestly it's not guillotining but it would have been pretty funny yeah um and Elaine is like well great to be here but uh let's get this show on the road everyone start training the peasants and get your actual armies to, we're going to transport you to this place. And I would just like to once again draw attention to the fact that the last battle starts two days from now. So Elaine, right now, being like, we need to conscript every able-bodied Kyrianan into the military and train them is not functional. It's wild. <laughs> they, these are guys who are going to be like, what? I was given a wooden sword I was given, yesterday. Yeah, and I don't know how to not stab myself. I don't know what how to listen to commands. Yeah. I don't know how to hold a formation. Yeah. These are going to be functionally useless, except <laughs> as cannon fodder, which I guess is fine for Elaine because she hates the poor. Yeah. But, like, consider what could have happened if we had Elaine take the throne of Kyrian, if this was what needed to happen. Like a month and a half ago, you might at least yeah. have this chapter. This section should have been moved way up. Yeah, um, and so should have Rand's. Yeah, this is also incredibly funny. This is so wild. We finally get Rand meeting with the Borderlander rulers, and again, as we referenced, I think in the last Rand point of view, he was like, "We've got to go talk to those Borderlanders." Yeah, and it seemed like he was going to do that tomorrow, and that was six hundred pages ago. Yeah. And it also seemed like when Rand said that, it had been two days since he came down from Enlightenment. Mm -hmm. So what is the truth? For every other character, it has been a month since Rand's Enlightenment. For Rand, it has been... 48 hours, maybe. Yeah. We don't know. Anyway, Rand arrives with Min, Kadzuan, Nourishman, eh, to this meeting. (laughs) Who is also now apparently important. Yeah, Nef. Nef. God forbid we use any of the other Existing Ashaman. Ashaman. I know, whatever. Um, they arrive at um, this meeting with the Borderlander rulers, and all that happens is Rand is like, hey, be- hey, girly, um, to all of them. So, hey. hey. And they come up and slap him one by one. And Min and Kat Swan, of course, are like, <gasps> girlish gasps yeah. of horror while Rand is like no no let them do it <laughs> and i'm like yeah let them do it yeah it's pretty funny actually. keep punching rand and then they ask rand they're like we have a very important question for you rand's like okay what the fuck is it they're like how did some lady die yeah. jane doe die and it's of course a name cat swan men have never heard of and rand has a war flashback and is like Demondred invaded, her blood on my hands, blah, 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 blah. And they're like, okay, you passed the test. And everyone's like, hey, what the fuck, besties? So one, the oldest Borderlander, I don't remember his name, yeah, I'm they're, sorry. They're not relevant. Really. Is like, my 
grandfather's 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 grandfather was pre passed down this prophecy throughout my family that we would be the ones to test the dragon reborn and prove that he is true and rand is like actively holding calendar yeah he's happens. like it has been 12 books actually yeah. since i proved that i'm the <laughs> dragon reborn so so what are we doing you are so late to the party yeah and cat's one was like what would have you have done if he had answered incorrectly would you have killed the dragon reborn and the guy's kind of like, ah, maybe. Yeah, probably. Like, we would have tried. You would have. She's like, you would have risked that. And he's like, another one would be spun out. And she's like, no, that's not how it works. You stupid piece of shit. Uh, also, this is just a quibble, but they're like, in the prophecy, it was like, you get to slap him and then you have to make sure that he knows that this lady died because Luz Thrin murdered her. Mm -hmm. And when Rand does his little flashback, it sounds like Luz Thrin did not murder her. Yeah. It sounds like she was killed in some sort of attack mm -hmm. and that he found her body or something. Yeah. But it seems like it would be pretty relevant in this series specifically if Luz Thurin had murdered a woman. Murdered a woman, yeah. And if Rand remembered that. Yeah. But it sounds like Luz Thurin, of course, the pattern's golden boy, yeah, was innocent of that. And so, but then no one is like, so... Your prophecy sucks. Your prophecy sucks. You're maligning Luz Thurin. This is libel or slander <laughs> or whichever one. sue you. <laughs> yeah. It's an all-around wild thing to do. The Borderlanders are so late to this party uh -huh. that it's actually a little bit incomprehensible. Yeah, the chapter ends with Rand being like, you either swear, swear fealty to me and come to the last battle with gateways or I'm literally going to leave you and your entire army here. And it's like, that is not really an ultimatum I don't know. I guess you have to give them an ultimatum if you're literally going to fight the Dark One tomorrow, but what? This is just like really, you know, a great illustration of how the narrative has prioritized some countries over others. Mm -hmm. The Borderlander, the Borderlands generally have been so extremely sidelined by the narrative. Yeah. And we're not blaming Brandon Sanderson for this, to be clear. No. This is 100% not Robert Jordan. Yeah. Like, he just sort of introduced that they'd be coming around, had them sort of floating around in Andor for books upon books upon books, which may be an actual timeline. Maybe in the actual timeline was two months. Mm -hmm. Okay, maybe that's reasonable. Except it took you six books, Robert Jordan, so it's actually not reasonable. So... And it's just like, Rand this entire time has been squirreling around in Tyr and Kyrian and Ilian mm -hmm. and Andor. And it's like, okay, I at some point accept that those are the only countries that the narrative actually cares about. Yeah. In terms of Rand's relationship to them and that everyone else is going to come, you know, the Borderlands are going to come because it's their duty. Yeah. The way they have been presented to us the entire time. Now we have a bunch of characters rolling up and being like, actually, no, we need to verify that you're the Dragon Reborn, even though everyone else has already verified it. Because we're important, too, and we want you to know that. Yeah. And we actually get to make the decision. And it's like, okay, if there was a prophecy, fine, but Rand should have had to deal with that way earlier. Yeah. At It would have been made infinitely more sense if the Borderlanders were like, hey, we're here, no prophecy, no testing. We just came to, because we're pissed that you didn't come to us. Yeah. What else were we supposed to do? Yeah. Like, we need to know what the plan is for the last battle. Like, do you yeah. have a strategy? Are you functioning as our general? Do we have a general? What's the chain of command? What, do we have supply lines? Do we have medics? Like, yeah, the fact that the Borderlanders wear... You guys, <laughs> this makes me so mad. The little Sun Tzu in my brain yeah. gets so mad at this. The Borderlands are patently where the last battle is going to take place. Uh huh. That uh -huh. is what the entire narrative has told us for the last 14 books. And that is what, you know, will happen. Mm -hmm. Borderlands, it's going to happen there. Yeah, it'll happen in some other places too, not to spoil it for you. But primarily the Borderlands, because that's where the Trollocs are. That's where they live. So you're telling me that 24 hours 
before we're set to kick off, the Borderlands have no armies, yeah. except whatever skeleton crews were left behind, no leadership, no way of communicating between the leadership and the skeleton crews, because the uh, Borderland rulers only have access to outdated channeling that doesn't include traveling. Mm-hmm. You're, it's, in, it's in shambles. Yeah. The, the whole idea of the Borderlanders, if we are to understand them as a people, that they would, as a, you know, a sort of, con- they're not one people, I know multiple countries, but with a sort of shared cultural identity. This region, yeah. Yeah, this region, thank you, that's the word I'm trying to look for. In this region, just taking all of their armies away from the actual border between this continent and the Blight, incomprehensible as just a plot point. Just bailing. Yeah, Absolutely incomprehensible. I could understand the like leaders going maybe, yeah. but taking any amount of army except like a bodyguard or two, incomprehensible. It is also just to not to really like nail down, not to like beat a dead horse on this book series, um, Eurocentrism, imperialism, colonialism, racism, colorism. The fact that the countries we spend the most time in are very obviously white european European countries countries. yeah you know i know we make a lot of jokes about Kyrie and being fantasy france but these the histories were being presented with a line to england france spain you know portugal these types of countries that were heavily involved in like the holy roman empire or whatever italy um and then we just completely fucking ignore the countries that are aligned with um asian cultures or Middle Eastern cultures, um, African cultures, any of that, indigenous cultures, the ale are only included by accident of Rand's birth or something. Because Robert Jordan was really into Dune. <laughs> yeah. Fighting over cinnamon. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, it's just like... My dad is so mad <laughs> that I don't want to watch Dune 2. You guys, I haven't seen Dune 1. And he's, like, acting like I've shot him. Yeah. What? Dads love Dune. I We should make t-shirts that say that. Dads love Dune. Yeah, and it just has a picture of Tillamy Shillamy on it. Dads love Dune and Tillamy Shillamy, <laughs> I guess. I guess. My dad is weirdly defensive of Tillamy Shillamy. <laughs> Maybe he's a fangirl and he just feels like he can't admit it because it's age-inappropriate or something. <laughs> I'm Tillamy Shillamy Stan. Yeah. I'm a 56-year-old man, and I love Tillamy Shillamy. <laughs> Tillamy Shillamy, for those who aren't in on the joke, is Timothy Chalamet. Um, yeah, sorry, that's just one of our household <laughs> phrases. <laughs> Along with, no one should have died that day. <laughs> I was literally thinking about that episode as I drove home today. It haunts my every waking It has thought. a grip on our household, guys. The 9-11 Bones episode. <laughs> it has like imprinted itself on this home we think about it when we wake up we think about it when we go to sleep it shook us to our core <laughs> nobody deserved to die and no what not for any of the reasons you're thinking of when you hear 9 11 bone bones episode it's so ridiculous um sorry we just no to <laughs> we just had to get that out there if we don't speak about it it will infect us even more um so just again to like once again highlight the racism and eurocentrism of this book all the countries who play very politically militarily important roles in the last battle rand has just completely ignored like if rand was actually thinking logistically like you said if there was a little sun Tzu in his brain being like okay, I need to go to the borderlands and learn the territory and make a plan of attack and start thinking these things through, spending time in the countries and landscapes where this will actually happen. Like, no offense, Kyrian, but you're far away. Like, it's important that you're stable, but... Yeah, Rand, like, went to Kyrian because the Shado went to Kyrian, and Rand was like, ooh, that was my bad. That's I should probably save on me. fantasy yeah. France. But it's like, okay, book six opens. Rand... You've got Andor and Kyrian on lock. The next step is not to start looking at Tyr and Ilion. The next step is, oh, hey, Bashir's on my doorstep. Be like, could you introduce me to your niece? Yeah. Next step is nail down the fucking borderlands. Yeah. 
But no. Maybe if Moiraine Rain had lived, she'd have been like... She'd been like, this is ridiculous. Who gives a fuck about Ilian? She'd have been like, go to the fucking borderlands. Let Ilian fucking perish. Yeah, Ilian is fine. Samael will kill himself in a freak accident one day yeah, because he's a moron. because like, <laughs> he's king stupid. Yeah. Samael will also try to invent cannons and blow up the whole palace. Samael was killed by fog, so oh. I don't think we need to worry about him all that much. Yeah. So... It's just incredible um, how absurd it is that the Borderlanders show up and Rand's like, oh, you have one day to entirely submit your entire region to my rule or you're going to be left behind, which is, I know he's like probably making some dumb gamble here, but it's like, is that a risk you can really take? It's really not. And also the fact that there are no consequences for this. Yeah. For either Rand or the Borderlands. Now Rand is going to walk into this meeting with Edwin with this rock solid alliance of the Borderlands behind him instead of them being like, uh, so yeah, we were forced to yeah. come here under his command. Like, you know, basically yeah. compulsion. Yeah, everyone else kind of at least got to make a deal or yeah. have some type of some type of agency in how their country moved with the Dragon Reborn. We did not. Yeah, and furthermore, no one is going to walk in and be like, hey, the Borderlands, why is this such a shit show? Because it won't be a shit show, because we couldn't just, like, commit to the fact that it would be a shit show. Yeah. We're so realistic when it comes to Kyrian and noblemen, <laughs> the quantity of Kyrian and aristocrats. <laughs> but when it comes to fucking supply lines, yeah, absolutely not. Nobody cares how we're feeding this continental army. Yeah. Or how we're getting them medical aid, or how we're getting them gunpowder for their cannons, or arrows for their bows. Yeah, and yes, I know because I've read the next book that the last battle doesn't literally happen tomorrow. But it happens pretty fucking soon. Yeah, but like, yes. like within a week, I think. Perhaps not tomorrow tomorrow, as in exactly 24 hours from now. But like, it is beginning to happen. Rand is going to the fields of Merlor. He's going to tell everybody to fuck off. And he's going to go start exploding magic rocks. Yeah, and they're like, oh, wow, rats. Ah, farts. We didn't convince him that this was a bad idea because that's obviously where the book has been going this entire time. Yeah. So I'm mad at the Borderlanders and I'm mad at Robert Jordan for making me mad at the Borderlanders. I know. Because they didn't actually do anything. You know, I mean, they did do something, but they were controlled by an author who didn't care about them. Yeah, who was also just like, we'll just abandon the blight to all of these Trollocs. And it's so sad because this like weird alliance of the four of them sounds, I mean, it's not any more compelling than any of the other like monarchies really, but like at least we have the makings of a very odd polycule here, you know? (laughs) This old guy, Bashir's mean niece. Yeah, Bashir's mean niece, Dilf. Dilf. Milf. Milf. And this other guy. (laughs) And it's like, cool, I would love to have followed the Borderlander monarchs around. Instead of having them have one meeting with Elaine and one meeting with Rand, and that's all we get from them. That's all we get from them. Baffling. It's also, the whole plot where they slap him is so ridiculous, because Rand's like, oh, if I would have come two days ago, you know, I would have killed everyone. I would have bailfired you. Yeah, and we're supposed to be, like, chilled by that, and it's like... Yeah, like, that meant nothing to me because I watched Rand nuke an entire town. Like, yeah, I know like, that would you've be already response. done the bad thing. Yeah. Yeah, so I don't really... Like, you've already been bad, and I know that you were bad, and nobody seems to care. So why should I care that this thing almost happened but didn't? Whatever. Now we have no choice. We have to talk about Matt. But we're going to talk as little as possible about Matt because it's so bad. Matt, it's also... Incidentally, the day before Matt will go to the Tower of Genji. So he's like surveying his camp. He does some paperwork. Um, Cool. He has a red scarf now. Yeah, Matt has a red scarf now. And he says the disgusting thing that he considered getting a pink scarf in honor of Tylen. Well, it's already pretty fucking disgusting because he's like, my scarf is in memory of Tylen and the others who fell to the Golam. Tylen's... I don't want to. I don't want to remind you guys, but Tywin's head was ripped off. Yeah. So the sort of blood red scarf mm. effect is a pretty grotesque. Yeah. Little memorialization yeah. of that memento mori incident. Memento mori. Um. <laughs> it's also kind of giving like that story about how the ribbon keeps the girl's head on. Yeah. <laughs> if Matt takes his that old second grade horror <laughs> story. Yeah. yeah. Matt takes his red scarf off. His head will fall off. Oh, Jesus Christ. Um, 
Satalanon shows up and they have a conversation that is effectively about nothing. Satalanon comes up and it's supposed to be four pages of banter. Um, they talk as they usually do about um, Satalanon being a former Aes Sedai. Um, and Satalanon is like, I don't know why you're so angsty with the Aes Sedai and noble people generally. And Matt's like, oh, I don't hate them. It's just that we, like, he's basically like, the socioeconomic disparity is too much for me to handle. Mm -hmm. Like, I was raised poor, so I'm never going to yeah. not see that in a person, which is a, a perfectly reasonable attitude for Matt to have, um, you know, man of the people, etc. Unfortunately, he represents this in the most insufferable way possible by doing an extended metaphor about, of all things, boots. And why I bring this up is because Terry Pratchett, acclaimed fantasy author, also had a metaphor about boots to explain socioeconomic politics. Mm. And his is a well-accepted, like, economic theory. Yeah. It has, like, fallen into the economic vernacular. It's called, um... Uh, wow. It's called boots theory, literally. Damn. And it's somewhat different. It's actually pretty much the inverse. Matt's holding is like, well, if you're a poor person, then you only have one pair of boots. And it's your good pair of boots, and it just sustains you for the rest of your life. Whereas if you're rich, you have a million pairs of boots to go with every outfit, blah, 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 blah. Um, in Terry Pratchett's boots theory, which is more about... Um, the conundrum that it is expensive to be poor. Mm. Um, I will quote from it directly. The reason that the rich were so rich, Vimes' reason, Vimes is the character speaking, was because they managed to spend less money. Take boots, for example. A man who could afford $50 had a pair of boots that would still be keeping his feet dry in 10 years' time, while a poor man who could only afford cheap boots would have spent $100 on boots in the same time and would still have wet feet. Yeah. Basically, money buys quality. Yeah. Um, and poverty buys quantity and also forces you to spend more, more money. money. Yeah. So I have no idea if Brandon Sanderson was trying to do a cute callback or if he had no idea what he was accidentally calling back to or whatever. Either way, it's kind of a slap in the face. Yeah, to just like try to present a, a theory of economics and class and like totally beef it. Beef it. <laughs> Just, like, totally miss the point. Just, like, do it in the most stupid way possible. Yeah. Well, Terry Pratchett, RIP to a real one. Yeah. Kisses for Terry. Um. Quite painful to read. I just yeah, want to say that again. I just, yeah, we've just already talked so much about Matt's character assassination that it's not much use to yeah go over it again. Um. So, like, nothing changes in Matt and Satalanon's relationship over this. It's like she literally wandered over had this conversation and then left it's functionally useless yeah but in this uh, matt tells us i'm going to tower of genji tomorrow and he tells us significantly he still has not opened varen's letter but neither of those things is really significant because we pretty much knew that from yeah the last time we saw matt so totally useless um in the next section of three chapters we will have a rare Pavara point of view. Again, now she's in the Black Tower, so we are infiltrating the enemy camp. We then have a Perrin point of view as he drops off Matt at the Tower of Genji. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> and then, you know, left turns to the fields of Marilor. Um, the idea of Perrin playing Matt's, like, Uber driver Chauffeur, yeah. to the Tower of I Genji. I mean, I guess it's going to be Grady or Neil. I can't remember which one. But he's like, yeah, see you later. Um, and then we will get uh, Matt, Tom, and Noel in the Tower of Genji. And it's that like, will be that. The that little chapter tile is fun with the snake and foxes. Yeah, the one yeah. left behind. Yeah, I like that. Uh, one of these chapters is significantly titled The Light of the World, calling back to Matt's prophecy way back in book four about how he'll give up the light of the world to save the world. Will that prophecy be fulfilled? Yes and no. Goodbye. <laughs> and Trickster. End of podcast. <laughs> Goodbye. Well, it's because of Robert Jordan and Brandon Sanderson's narrative failings that I say that. There have been a lot of them in this section alone. 
This section was bad and I'm mad. That's Me mine. too. I'm also mad. We'll just get another really mad yeah, section. Yeah, I see that one. It didn't even color inside the lines. We were so mad. Yeah, that, was, that was too on, so. Yeah. <clears throat> My arch fucking nemesis. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> for f- <laughs> Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening, everyone. Um, you can take... Th- th- <laughs> I just blue screened and Sally whispered, you can do it. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks to Glenna McKenzie for our theme song. Thanks to our patrons on Patreon and our followers on social media. We're so grateful for you folks. Yeah, you guys are the best. Thanks for listening to our Ding Dong podcast. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll do the sign off. The sign off is that tomorrow, as we're recording, is Friday night. I'm a woman in my 30s, got a rich and vibrant social life, yet I will be spending the evening tomorrow with my parents watching the BBC miniseries Little Dorrit, a Dickens adaptation. And my dad told me that he can't just watch an episode here or there. It's 14 episodes. I checked on IMDb. Because... He will forget what's going on between episodes. <laughs> this man has seen Little Dorrit by my count at least five times already. Oh my god. Oh my god. So. Does Chris want you to sit down and watch yeah, all 14 he lit, yeah, hours of Little that's Dorrit? His, that's his ideal is seven full hours watching Little Dorrit. Oh, Chris thinks he could sit down for seven hours and, and watch something. He has something. so much ADHD. And he would be like, I suddenly have to go do eight hours of work in the middle of this. And then you and Becky would be trapped. No, my mom will have wandered out on hour two, Max. <laughs> ADHD queen. She'll be like, goodbye. Bye. I have other things to do. I don't want to be here anymore, yeah, so. I'm leaving. That's what's going on. Okay, okay, everyone. Have a good week. Bye-bye. Bye.